Right. Hello, this is the Lunar Poetry Podcast. I'm David Turner, and this month I'm in Sheffield with the wonderful Helen Moore. Um, just as a quick side note, because of time restrictions uh, in the podcast, my questions regarding Helen's poetry will mainly focus on her book, Division, Division Street, published by Chateau and Windus. Uh, we're going to kick off with Helen give us, giving us a short introduction into her work and background. Yeah, my name is Helen. I was born in Sheffield in, and then I grew up in Chesterfield just down the road. So I suppose growing up Sheffield was always a bit like the glamorous older sister to Chesterfield. It was the place where you went out and where you, or where you, you, you were able to go on the bus on your own when you're old enough, that kind of place. It's always the bright <laughs> lights really. Um, and now I live back in Sheffield again after spells being in different places including um, a year when I was poet in residence at the Wordsworth Trust in Cumbria, in Grasmere, and where I wrote quite a lot of the poems that became my collection, Division Street. Um, so it was quite interesting because I was living up in the lakes but writing all these poems about Sheffield and South <laughs> Yorkshire and Derbyshire. So my work has always been quite informed by this particular bit of the world, so I think it's yeah. quite nice that we're doing the interview in rainy Sheffield today. It's pretty wet, isn't it? It does look really northern outside. It, it does, yeah. Oh, and on that note, we've got a whippet in the room. <laughs> Charlie, do, the yeah. whippet. It's raining, we're drinking tea, and there's a whippet on the side. But <laughs> just, I mention that just in case you hear any strange licking noises or growling, if not. Definitely not me. not us. <laughs> Charlie might introduce himself. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to begin with like a really needlessly long anecdote about... Mm -hmm. Uh, a guy I met recently in a pub in Kennington in South London. Um, as I looked across the bar, I noticed a guy wearing a t-shirt which had Orgreave 84 across the top of it. And um, I don't know, he was maybe in his 50s or 60s, this guy. Uh, so I went over to him and, and asked him about the t-shirt if I could have a closer look. And it was like one of those uh, sort of graffiti style mm -hmm. hoodie figures throwing throwing a stone, which was quite apt. But, um, we end up chatting about your work and your poem, Scad, in particular, and Jeremy Deller's reenactment, uh, which we'll come to later. And he was surprised and pleased that people like us, and by that I mean people too young to have any living memory of yeah. what happened at Orgreave and other pickets, but he was pleased and surprised that we still know what went on. Mm. Um, what I'm wondering is how much influence does your... Does your wider families working class background and roots have on your work and also do you write about these subjects as mentioned in SCAB in order to educate the unfamiliar or rather to reassure those that were involved in the picketing that the, that those events haven't been forgotten? Yeah I think it's a bit of both and yeah. especially that, that's a really good point you just made this idea about him wanting to reassure people that things haven't been forgotten. I'd say that's probably the main reason or one of the main inspirations behind writing yeah. Scalp. Um, I actually, I, I'd wanted to write about it for quite a long time mm. and everything that sort of happened to me it may just confirm that and I remember reading David Peace's amazing book GB84 um, okay. at the time when I was thinking of writing about it I thought wow he's written about the minor strike brilliantly yeah, yeah. I'd love to be able to write something myself but I put it off for ages I really hesitated because I felt like as somebody that hadn't lived through the strike myself um, and as someone that didn't have immediate family members involved in the strike I felt like a bit of a fraud or yeah. like I didn't have a right to write about it. I know that there are other poets who were involved in various ways in in the strike in the 80s that have tried to write about it and it took me ages to, to recognise that hang on a minute that's exactly why I should and um, because I wanted <clears throat> to show that that growing up in a bit of northeast Derbyshire that was physically and more than physically scarred by the impact of pit closure. I remember as a kid um, never really understanding what all these weird land masses were just down the road sure. from where we lived and, and the words that my parents would use to describe them I didn't really understand, it's like that's a landfill site mm. and that's open casting and I thought what's open casting? Um, and I was actually, it was actually very close to the village Arkwright that they moved across the road to make way for open casting after okay. the pits had been closed. And there was quite a lot of controversy about that when I was growing up. Um, 
so all those things I wanted to show I suppose that the legacy lives on and that it's important to, to me just growing up with the aftermath uh, it's important to lots of people as mm. you say of our generation and that it's not been forgotten at all and that maybe the fact that I wasn't there could in some ways be a virtue and it could provide a way of writing about it that had a different perspective and actually a bit of distance because you do get that problem sometimes don't you that things are and I you know I can't imagine if I'd been there in some way or witnessed it first hand I almost don't know how you'd begin to put it into words because it's too terrible so in some ways I thought I'll try yeah I suppose there's that side of it isn't it it maybe is actually once you start easier to write about it if you haven't been there mm. because what you're doing is uh, retelling stories that you've heard or um, not e not editing out things but you'll put you'll put in you, it's easier for you to put the worst things together in a poem because it's not as, as emotional for you, yeah. you know, whereas you know for a lot of people there it would have I mean, actually, going back to this guy in the mm -hmm. pub, Johnny Eagles, I think his name was, it was just an amazing name. <laughs> he immediately started having a blazing row with this guy who sat next to him, who was a Tory. And they, they, I think they've known each other for years and years. But, but just by me mentioning uh, Orgreave, yeah. I mean, he had the T-shirt on, but by me mentioning the fact to him, they immediately went back to that um, that argument, you know, which they probably had 30 years ago. You know? Yeah, definitely. You know, and it was as bitter then you know so it's, you can you can understand why people haven't let go of these uh, I think in, I've heard various people say to me that they they don't like the cover of my book because um, I should probably describe this for the yes, benefit yeah. of, of the <laughs> podcast because you can't see it but the the book cover uses a really famous image by a wonderful photographer called Don McPhee uh, which is taken from the Battle of Little Grieve and it's got um, two policemen in their hats um, face to face with a miner who's got a fake sort of policeman's hat on with his NUM stickers on it and they're, they're sort of squaring up to each other and to me that epitomises this sort of yeah huge divide mm. and the, the rift that's never really been healed yeah. since that civil war in the 80s um, and yeah I was told it's a bad cover because it's going to divide people and it's going to polarise people and I thought well isn't that maybe appropriate in some ways I'm I not think sure it, that I mind that I think it's appropriate but I also think that one of the messages from that image is that that image could be flipped if you switched the hats around them if it wasn't three sideburns the guy the miner yeah. you wouldn't necessarily he could, you know they could be on either side they're all men they're probably all from the same region you know they've been divided by d decisions above them haven't they you know and then, and yeah, I and I think that was the, one of the things that I find most poignant about, or upsetting about the, the strike that, mm. that 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 communities got ripped apart by, yeah, by things that were beyond their control yeah. in some ways. And uh, yeah, I've always liked that image for that reason, but also because there's something a little bit playful about it as well. That's it's quite like, furry as well, isn't of, it? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a moment that's quite funny as well yeah, as yeah. very sad. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I like it as well. Uh, right, so we'll get on to your other work in a moment, but I'd like to focus still on this poem, Scab. Uh, in, that po in the poem you talk about going off to study at Cambridge University and uh, being a crossing of a personal picket line for you. Mm. Um, how much of a personal conflict was your move to Cambridge from uh, Derbyshire? And how much guilt did you feel at the time regarding the issue of like cutting your roots? I mean, whether that was real or yeah. not? I think it was in so it's interesting in terms of the poem that when I first started to write it, none of that stuff was in there. Yeah, yeah. I was just trying to write about Orgreave, sure. um, and then later, so I think you mentioned might come to later, Jeremy Dallas' mm -hmm. film about Orgreave. So I was trying to write about those things, and it just felt like something was lacking. And it took me a while to work out what that was, and I realised it's like, well, what makes you uncomfortable about this? Why do you want to write about it? And what it, I think often poetry does come from a sense of discomfort or mm -hmm. an itch that you can't scratch or, or, or just something like that. And it just came to me at one point, I'm not sure when. It, yeah. it wasn't like a massive thunderbolt revelation, but it, this realisation crept up that it was to do with my feelings of not so much guilt maybe, but alienation and isolation that I felt yeah, when I was at perhaps university. The, the word guilt is too strong. But, um, um, yeah, although yeah. maybe it isn't. I don't yeah, know, it's actually. <laughs> it's certainly a kind of guilt. And um, 
Because because maybe the, the reason that guilt does strike me as an, an apt word mm. is that um, I've got this really clear memory of the, when I found out I'd got my offer to go to Cambridge. It was close to New Year's Eve mm. and I was spending New Year's Eve in Kalo Working Men's Pub which has now been knocked down and <laughs> they haven't cleared the rubble away so it's really <laughs> surreal you just walk past yeah. for a while I was living recently I was living quite close to it and every day I'd walk past the, the rubble of this building yeah. it was really strange anyway um, I, I was there with my friends from school and I didn't tell anybody I didn't mention it to anybody that I got this offer and that I was probably going to go to Cambridge University and I thought I should surely I should be really excited about that and I should be really proud about that or something but I wasn't in in some way I think because I felt like in some way the people I was with were going to think that I thought I was better than them because of that or so I suppose there is a guilt in that way and then when I was there which I think is reflected in the poem um, I knew it was a great opportunity for me and I really enjoyed some aspects of it but I did feel quite at times quite socially isolated mm. and, and like I didn't fit in um, and actually it was really weird for me because um, I was used to at home in Chesterfield I was used to people at school calling me posh and stuff okay, like that because yeah, yeah. I did my work and mm. I got on with things and, and, and whatever and and then suddenly, when I went away from there, when I went to university, I felt the opposite, and I felt like I didn't fit in with all the rituals. Yeah, I think things. that's quite a good point, actually. I suppose, um, I mean, I'm a few years older than you, but we're the same generation as such. Mm -hmm. um, I, I found it a lot with people of our age that have grown up in a very working-class family. I feel slightly guilty, maybe, because we grew up in a time where you're really not working class. If you've grown, yeah. even if you have that working class background, you've grown up in a in what essentially 20 years ago would have been or 30 years ago would have been a really middle class upbringing. Yeah, you probably had yeah. plenty of toys when you were a kid, and you got a good yeah. ed education. You could go to the doctors whenever you wanted. So that guilt that you're you're being forced to leave your roots as such because you're not never going to be as working class as your parents. Yeah. If you can, you know. If you, yeah. But if you, at the same time if you go to university, you're never going to fit in that sort of that traditional middle class or you know, yeah. sort of upper middle class setting either so you're, you're left floating between and you do have that I suppose it takes a while to gauge what identity you've got and probably I think most people just reconcile that they are still working class in attitude and, yeah. and uh, outlook on life but it might take a while to get there and I suppose as artists whichever way you choose to work it it's a natural process to go through to find your yeah. yeah, and you use your art to yeah, sort of, yeah. because I suppose that's one of the things I was trying to do in, in that poem in some ways, um, I suppose the poem's about lots of things, but it was this sense, you think, well, what what is class really, and, and what do I feel about that, and, and it's very complicated, mm. and so the poem's a way of saying, well, perhaps it's just sometimes you don't feel like you particularly belong anywhere, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you, you you can't win. You sort of on both sides, and that in turn made me think back to uh, yeah, maybe more political situations and yeah. things where you also can't win, and it's it's kind of all like that. So I don't know that that poetry ever helps you to resolve anything or get to the bottom of it, but it certainly helps you express the questions, if not the answers, doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't think I've ever answered anything with poetry. No. <laughs> Um, I need to confuse myself. I do have a, a poem in which um, some students in Sheffield thought that they could work out the answers to a pub quiz oh, yeah. from from <laughs> the questions yeah, in yeah. my poem, and they were really upset when they found out I'd made up this pub quiz question. <laughs> we wanted the answer. Yeah, yeah. Good to <laughs> Actually, that um, if we've got time, we could go, get onto that. I, I quite uh -huh. like that issue of um, uh, truth in poetry, or whether, uh -huh. whether we need to tell the truth I suppose because I've noticed a lot of people get upset if they find out you've lied to them yeah. <laughs> a poem which is ridiculous because if you're writing flash fiction or a novel there's no expectation to absolutely to and 90% of the time you are, you're not lying to them but you're not saying exactly what happened no, it's a dramatised yeah, version of it in some way know, our lives are boring that's why we write poetry exactly we'll do anything <laughs> else other than talk about exactly. our lives <laughs> um, actually yeah that's uh, so, that was an unintentional link into this next one. <laughs> a real sense of um, storytelling from your work. Yeah. And it's almost as though with a few minor changes to the wording, you could 
and I mean this was a compliment, you could just be chatting in the corner of a local somewhere, mm. do you know what I mean? Um, thinking in particular of uh, Stainless, Steel, uh, Stainless Stephen, sorry, poem, where there's a blurring of the line between story and myth, quite yeah. common after a few beers. I mean, how do you feel about that assertion? I, I really like that you've picked up on that. That's because you're never sure if people get things from you working on. That's certainly something I'd quite like if people did yeah. in one way. And um, I, I always think um, I'm very interested in pubs mm. as. Not, not just in general, but, um, <laughs> but um, as, as a place where things happen and where everything happens. And, um, you know, it's no coincidence, is it, that if you watch EastEnders or whatever, it, it always happens, stuff always the happens. The drama is yeah. Definitely. <laughs> and um, it really got brought home to me when I spent a year living in Grasmere in the Lake District, it's a very small village. And the pub was, if you wanted to find out anything, if you wanted to see someone, if bump into them if you wanted to know the gossip you, you just went to the local sure. pub because there's just one really and um that i suppose i've always liked the way that people do tell each other stories at the bar and you can get you can get talking to anyone like you say like the guy you met in the sure, yeah. augury t-shirt and i actually wrote a pamphlet a few years ago called the pint for the ghost mm -hmm. and the idea of this pamphlet was that all the poems in it could be things that stories that people might tell you in a pub after hours and that's where stainless stephen comes from yeah. it's from that that um that particular pamphlet so mm -hmm. yeah i think i'm interested in that because i think people's throwaway stories or things that they say after they've had a few pints or whatever are really important and they're really <laughs> interesting Sometimes you, more interesting than more crafted uh, storytelling. Yeah, yeah. And, but do, actually going back to what we were talking about before, do you feel like you have an obligation to carry on that kind of storytelling in order to keep contact with, you know, um, your friends and family from childhood? Do, is there a link in that way of writing that connects mm. you? I don't think it's conscious, no, but no. I think it's ingrained. Yeah. Maybe I've just spent too much time in the pub, that's obviously... Yeah. <laughs> no, but, I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no, I, I think um, maybe it is on some level. Hmm. Um, maybe you, you, you want to... I think there's always part of you that's trying to write poems that people that you know, perhaps, or people that you care about would understand yes, or yeah. that they'd be able to relate to in some yeah. way. And that's I mean, I certainly feel in my writing that if, if my, for instance, I'm, I go to the pub sort of whenever I can on a Sunday my uncle and his dad go mm -hmm. every like religiously every Sunday and um, I sort of have a feeling that if they I mean they had no interest in reading my poetry but if they did I, I would expect my right to be clear enough for them to understand or yeah. to be written in a manner uh, not that I consciously try and change anything but I suppose yeah. it's just because it's there ingrained anyway it's coming out in that style mm -hmm. yeah. yeah definitely you, you get writing, I think the writing habits probably get formed quite early yes, on, probably yeah. before you know that yeah. they have done in some way. I suppose so. once you become more more comfortable with writing, I suppose then it just becomes your language anyway, and you're just yeah. speaking through the paper anyway, aren't you? So yeah. It goes, probably comes back to how you learn to speak in the first place. Yeah, definitely. This is Stainless Stephen. He haunts the chippies mostly, nodding his approval at the puns. A salt and battery in cod we trust. He's dressed up to the nines in stainless shoes, a plated vest, two spoons for a bow tie, a fork to comb his sleek black hair. He says, I'm aimless, comma brainless, comma stainless Stephen, semicolon, semi-conscious, ordering my chips, full stop. And when the shop lads shove him out into the cold, he knows a pub across the river where the doors will never shut. A shell between the empty works where brambles twine around the pumps and every glass is draped with webs. Where men stride in, still sweating from the braziers that vanished thirty years ago and tug their collars, loosening the noose of heat. The jukebox hasn't changed its tune since 71. The landlord stands a statue at the bar a stainless saunters in and tips his silver hat, surveys his audience. The roughed up chairs, the yawning window panes, the shabby walls that echo back each joke as if they know them off by heart. Semi-quaver 
semi-frantic, stainless croons the golden oldies, sing-alongs to sway to, here in Sheffield, where they drink till dawn and beg for encores, no, there's no such thing as time. Um, I think you've got a real a great efficiency of language, if I can put it like that. Um, one example I'd like to give for the listen, listeners for context is uh, from your poem, Other People's Dreams. Oh, yeah. Um, and it is, if I'm trying to do this justice. <laughs> Though your hair is jet black for disguise, you are the photographer in your mother's nightmare, angling the camera at a door. And I don't think anyone could uh, read reading that could fail to connect with this simple description of the idea that one can appear in someone else's dreams while you know, have it in a different physical form. Um, has, I suppose it comes back to what we were just talking about there. Has, has that style of writing developed consciously? We may have just answered that actually. Um, but no, I do think that's a different question. Yes, I think okay. about um, efficiency that, 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 yes, or pairing yeah, yeah, yeah. things back. I suppose you could just say I'm really lazy. I was like, why well, use three <laughs> words when you could use one? No, I think it's probably to do with a lot of the writers that I suppose that I first read, mm. like people like Seamus Heaney actually, um, was one of the first writers yeah. that I read. Um, and then maybe later on, people. I, I admire a lot of poets who write very differently to me. That might sound odd. So. Um, for example, Raymond Carver in his poems, mm. or that Bukowski, I've always really okay, admired yeah, yeah. Bukowski, and they might sound like weird models because I don't write anything like that in some ways, but when I think about a lot of the writers that I admire, they are often quite stripped back yeah. and quite sort of, and again, it, maybe, it, maybe it's sort of related to trying to trying to be poetic of course and, and say things in a way that sounds nice hopefully yeah, yeah. whether I succeed or not it's a different matter but to, to pay attention to sound and rhythm but also to use natural patterns of speech as much as possible mm. um, and again you know I can think of poems in Division Street that definitely don't do that and they sound perhaps overly poetic but sometimes um, I think yeah you feel like you've, I certainly feel like I've achieved what I wanted to when I've written something that's conversational but also musical yeah. that's the ultimate aim okay. I think for me so yeah maybe it comes from the writers that I like to read and, and yeah. Actually, start um, that kind of thing I, I didn't study literature so I'm not really mm -hmm. sure how the whole process works but was it, did you have any strong influences from teachers or tutors or any kind of mentors in terms of how you use your language in, this, in the way we're talking about now or is it just from what you were reading uh, well I've never really studied English either no, um, no. I did psychology when I was yes. at uni and before that my school didn't really um, I, I don't mean this in a way to bad mouth it because mm. it doesn't mean that the, the teaching wasn't good but they just didn't have the scope really to focus sure. that much on poetry and I think the poems that we used to look at in school were really really old I remember looking at Christina Rossetti and all these ballads and things yeah. like that um, and Tennyson and things like that. And maybe that had some influence on me because it's quite musical again and I've always been interested in music but um, yeah I, I'm, I'm not really sure I, I, I often feel quite an imposter as a writer because I feel like having not studied English at university or anything like that or no, there's all these gaps in my knowledge there's all these great poets that I've just read a bit of yeah. because I've, I've try to fill in the gaps later and I, or I've read them and frankly haven't understood them or there's writers that I've still not made a proper effort with because it's easier to read you know whoever it is these work you really love and yeah. who you admire and and that you get that instant kind of gratification from so I, I sometimes feel like I've not worked hard enough at reading the canon if you like like all the so um I suppose I couldn't I couldn't really pick out one moment from school or from higher education or anything like that that sort of no, switched no, me on to okay. poetry. Um, but I have had lots of helpful poet mentors. Yeah, that so that's what I was thinking as well. Yeah, yeah, their wing, yeah. I suppose. Um, there was a fantastic writer who's just published a book actually called Michael Bailey, who mm. I met when I lived in Cambridge, and he used to do just these little workshops in his house. It'd be just a couple of people that he okay. knew and him sitting round and he'd just read you poems that he thought were really good and talk about why they were really good yeah. and a lot of that would be quite paired back 
imagistic sort of short short line stuff because that's the style that he writes in and so maybe that has some kind of influence in the kind of thing I like yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah I often feel a little bit of a fraud myself as I was doing a poetry <laughs> podcast and I got a D uh, English, uh, you uh, <laughs> English lit. D in English language. I haven't studied anything. But, um, that surely no, makes you better qualified yeah, to yeah. to judge it properly. Though, Maybe, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you I think what you're saying, I think a lot of people will quite find quite refreshing anyway, because you know it's poetry, like all literature and all art. You should, you should take it as you find it anyway, and if you like parts of it, you should enjoy it, and you shouldn't be forced to. I, I, I'm quite uncomfortable with this idea that you should have been well read. Yeah. Uh, over a lot of things, you know, is it just to enjoy poetry because that, that doesn't work? You wouldn't say to someone, "You must have seen every style of painting to enjoy um, point, uh, pointed or something like that." Yeah. You know, so, yeah. Um, actually, so, so while we're talking about education um, or mm-hmm. educational lack of it or whatever, um, I've seen that you work on a regular or fairly regular basis with educational projects in mm-hmm. in local schools. Um, uh, I've got some questions about that, but maybe you could uh, tell us a little bit about the projects and how you got involved in them. Okay. Um, well, I do all sorts, really, and I've sort of fallen into all of it by accident. Mm. I always knew from when I started writing a bit more seriously that I wanted to teach in some way, and I wanted to sort of share my enthusiasm for poetry with other people. I think the first thing I did was I volunteered to work... No, I didn't volunteer. I persuaded them to employ me, that's right. <laughs> Probably by pretending I knew what I was doing when I didn't. Um, there was a charity in Cambridge that used to work with trying to provide creative workshops um, for people that didn't have access to them that often. So I ended up working... That, that was my first proper job doing any kind of teaching. I was working on an estate in Huntingdon um, with a group every week and mm. usually just one person turned up so it was quite dispiriting <laughs> but it was a good introduction so I suppose I first did adult education and then later I worked for the Open University okay. um, and taught on one of their online courses so I've always done a lot of online teaching and still do and then the school's work has happened more recently because I was lucky enough to I applied for this great role called Derbyshire Poet Laureate, um, which happens every two years in Derbyshire, they get a new person to do it. And one of the reasons I wanted to do that was I knew it would involve a lot of schools work and I really wanted to to work with primary and secondary schools. And partly because I would have loved that when I was a a kid. We never had a writer come into our school and work with us and I just thought, what a great thing to do. And I also thought it'd be good for me and I'd learn a lot from the kids. And a half, mm. so it's worked, yeah. Uh, yeah, and actually on that point, I mean, do, do, do you think that enough poets get involved with educational programmes? And, and if there aren't, why do you think that, that is? Um, I think I can imagine them being put off. Um, I don't know how many. Do, I, I seem to know a lot of people that, that do yeah. that work in schools, but that could just be the people I that once I know. You start, then you, yeah, 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 you know more and more yeah. people that do, and it can be daunting because you do. I've had this feeling loads of times where you go into a, a school and you just think, oh God, what you know, they're going to be bored by me. They're going to hate this, especially I have to say older kids and teenagers. I really like working with 10, 11 year olds. Yeah, yeah, They're yeah. really responsive. <laughs> it's sometimes a bit more of a challenge when you get older, but I think everybody should because it's such a gift to you as well as hopefully to the kids. And people always get more from it than you think. You know, yeah. even the kids, especially sometimes the kids that don't want to join in at first and that are really put off by it. Um, so that's why I'm really interested in, I don't work for them myself, but initiatives like First Story that yeah. have um, relationships with schools and build on that and try and get a programme going year on year and they, they take the schools on residential courses as well. I think stuff like that's brilliant. And the other thing I've found interesting since I've been working in schools around Derbyshire is that often it's not the... Uh, this isn't a surprising thing in a way really it's not the schools that are supposedly the best academically that are the best to work in mm-hmm. in fact often it's quite the opposite yeah. um, and I, my favourite workshop I've done in the last few years was in Shirebrook Academy down on the road from where my mum and dad live and I was talking to the the um, students there about memories of 
mining and Shirebrook is a mining community. I was just staggered by some of the things that they wrote about what's happened to Shirebrook over the past 30 years and its lost loss of aspects of heritage and what it's like now and what it used to be and how much these um, students of 12, 13 knew about their history mm -hmm. and about where they came from. It was really inspiring. I suppose that it goes back to this whole idea of story setting then, doesn't mm -hmm. it? And if you can open kids' minds to the fact that it is just a form of storytelling, they can do that anyway. You know, that's the, the probably perfectly placed to do that. You know, if you just allow them to to have a voice. Um, do you find you have to? Actually, this quite yeah. Do you find you have to stay away? initially from any form of structure or meter or, or and just to, you know just to get get the interest first yeah I don't tend to get and I, I could be wrong in this I don't know if it's the best approach um, but I don't tend to get too hung up on even even making sure that they're writing what you know what might be generally considered poetry mm. um, I'm more interested in storytelling That's I suppose true. so just what they want to say about for example, in that case, where you come from or whatever it happens to be. But actually, you kind of find the reverse as well. I go into a lot of schools where the students actively want to write in metre or okay. in rhyme because they think that's what poetry is. Mm. Or they don't like... Po I've had people say to me, I don't like poetry that doesn't rhyme, it's rubbish. And <laughs> they're sort of seeking that out. And I suppose in those cases, I always just try and say, well, yeah, if that works for you and it's the best way to express yourself, brilliant. If it's holding you back from saying what you want to say, then maybe for now you should forget about that structure yeah, yeah. and maybe think about it at a later stage when you're editing your poem or hmm. whatever. So. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know how much you've seen of the, the sort of regular teaching of poetry at sort of GCSE level, but do you think anything in particular could be done to improve the teaching I mean for, not from poets visiting I mean from mm. the, the teacher's point of view um, I don't know I, I do think it's good that they get to as, as far as I know um, a lot of schools now take their students to have a kind of road show with some okay. of the poets whose work is in the anthology that they study at GCSE right. and they get to do things like that I think encouraging people to listen to more poetry like resources like the Poetry Archive is a really good thing because just because as we all know sometimes poems just make more sense when you hear the poet reading them and yes. you hear them explaining them I think anything that that can enable people to relate to them in that way has got to be good and um, so things like that and like so I quite like the poetry by heart competition that they have now where they get people to learn poems mm. and then say them because I do think there can be an enjoyment in that if you're not just being forced to all learn the same poem by rote yes. if you're being encouraged to choose a poem that you've got a connection with for whatever reason, it speaks to you and it engages with you or it says something about you in your life and you want to internalise it and remember it and then, you know, possibly keep that poem forever. I mm. think that's got to be a, a really interesting thing. Definitely. And I think that's a good point actually about once you know the thinking behind a, a poem or what, what mm. the poet's trying to achieve, it's easier. The main reason behind the podcast, actually, is because yeah. I think if we can get enough, enough poets to talk about what they're trying to do, yeah, it's much easier to understand their work then, because you've got a connection with them, you know. And if you hear them maybe read a couple of poems, it's easier to access the rest of their work, I think, and even more complicated stuff. I think there's a real lack of because um, I come from a fine art background mm -hmm. and only started writing recently and performing, but it's much more common. Um, within fine art, or much it's expected of artists to explain and engage in yeah. conversation. Not all do it. Some of them, are, some are lazy because the people, you know, they're not. <laughs> it doesn't seem to exist as much in with poetry. Yeah, there's always more mystery around the place, yeah. isn't, isn't there? I suppose the thing that springs to mind when you say that about art and things is that um, some, some someone whose work I love as a whole, not just the artwork, mm. but the process around it, is. Um, all the stuff that Grace and Perry does yes. for TV, where yes. you see, I love seeing um, how he turns his ideas about something into this artwork. I think it's magic. Yeah. And you see him getting false starts sometimes or getting frustrated about the pro, and, but then somehow he finds the right form for whatever idea he's trying to express. Um, in his case, I suppose, a physical form. But I always watch things like that and I think, well, that's not that dissimilar from 
what you do with a, with a poem sometimes. I mean, some yeah. poems do just arrive, actually. Yeah. Sometimes I don't know I'm going to write something until I do. But others, like the example, <coughs> um, like the example we talked about with Scav yeah. in the beginning, sometimes it is a long process of working out how you're going to put something into words and what things are going to come together and what you want to express. So I always think, wouldn't it be great if you could do something, that, yeah, a documentary like that mm. with poetry? It wouldn't be as visually appealing though, would it? It wouldn't, yeah. Also, I don't think poetry's got a Grace and Perry, really, so I don't right. know if I Maybe I should start recording a uh, podcast in a dress. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, possibly. Uh, uh, <laughs> we'll move on from that, I think. That <laughs> um, so, uh, you were inspired or maybe say you were enabled to write Scab after seeing Jeremy Deller's video piece uh, called The Battle of Orgreave in which he reenacts running battles between police officers and, and striking miners in Orgreave, South Yorkshire in 1984. Um, without stating the obvious, uh, I mean what was it about that work that inspired you or allowed you to um, this links nicely back to what we talked about at the very start, which is I was struggling to work out how I was going to try and write about this mm. thing that I cared very passionately about, but also felt a bit anxious trying to write about. And about the same time when I was mulling all these ideas over, I went to the um, BFI archives yes. in London, and I just it just so happened that they'd got a mining special uh, in the archive. <laughs> And I must have sat there for about eight hours watching mining film after mining film. And right at the end, I found Jeremy Deller's The Battle of Orgreave. And it was brilliant, not just because it's such a powerful film anyway, and because what he's doing is totally bizarre. He's yeah, going to recreate yeah. this very emotive battle in the place where it happened with people who were involved. Mm. I mean, that's crazy, isn't it? But also because it, it, it tied into this idea of mine that we when terrible things happen to communities they do get reenacted over and over and over in the memories of of the people that were affected in future generations like those kids from Shirebrook I was mentioning yeah. that still knew everything about the strike even though you know they're the generation on from from us they're further away from it in some ways so yeah I wanted to show how conflict never gets forgotten and it gets played out in other ways as well it gets recycled mm -hmm. and the anger gets bottled up and then the anger gets turned into something else and i thought jeremy Deller's films are really good sort of um, motif for that in some ways yeah no i it, it was um i was really glad when i heard you read scab for that song because um Je i mean jeremy Deller's one of my favorite artists anyway and uh, the reenactment is uh, just a little bit of background in case anyone's listening and doesn't know mm -hmm. what it is he um involved uh, miners that were in in the original strike and civil war reenact reenactment uh, enthusiasts and you know, got them to reenact these running battles across uh, fields and it was crazy and it was quite brutal and it's and you can see that anger still the it's, the emotions still run high for the people that were were there and there are a couple of points where you can see the guys that are just there for reenacting aren't really <laughs> sure scared. they want to get involved <laughs> my favourite bit yeah, yeah. Sort of like, well it's a bit different from you know wielding an antique sword <laughs> yeah. in a castle somewhere in Doncaster yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. they were a bit bit nervous and that really comes across yes. you know, in, yeah, the, yeah. in the film I actually met Jeremy Deller at Tim oh, the most you? intimidating time I've read a poem I think was in Chesterfield Winding Wheel at an event to mark 30 years since okay. the strike um, with lots of X mine is there and they asked me to read Scab and they also had Jeremy Della there talking about his <laughs> film and I just thought oh no they're going to crucify me they're yeah, going to yeah, think yeah. it's a liberty and it's mm. and how dare you it wasn't like that and actually the, that wasn't the case people were just happy that as you said at the start that the somebody still talking was about still talking yeah, 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 yeah. and Jeremy Della was lovely and because I also got worried that he might not like the portrayal of his film in yeah, the poem yeah. or he might disagree with it but no he was fantastic. Uh, no, I get the impression, I mean, I've only seen interviews with him but I get the impression that you spoke about the film in the way that he would want it to be spoken about. That's you good. I, I think so. I mean, <laughs> it's I don't, a relief. I, yeah. um, actually while we're talking about art and Jeremy yeah. Denner and such, um, I mean this is a personal gripe for me, I mean I find it a constant surprise that more poets and artists don't collaborate yeah. um, more often and 
or take the work of the other person as a starting point. I mean, how, how do you feel? I mean, you might not really have an opinion on this, but um, how do you feel about that? I really like this. I've not had that much opportunity to work with artists, but there's a poem in Division Street called Seven Decapitations. Yeah. And that was written in response to the work of a brilliant painter called Tom de Freston. And he's brilliant because he he's very active in approaching writers and saying, look, he, he's prolific, he produces mm. new work all the time. He's like, look, I've got these paintings. And why don't you respond to one? Or And his latest project that he did called The Charnel House, he, it was great because he did a bit of both. So uh, he'd approached quite a lot of writers and got them to respond to some of his artwork. And then he'd also then himself picked out lines from the poems and incorporated okay. those into the book. So it was a two-way process mm. of collaboration. And I really enjoy working like that because I think you find very often at the beginning you're really not sure what's going to happen. And I think that's good because if mm. you already knew how you were going to respond, there'd be no discovery in it. Absolutely. Yeah. And very often it prompts you to write something that you just wouldn't otherwise have done. Do you, do you feel that writers or poets are maybe a, a bit guarded about giving their work to someone to mess about with, perhaps? Yeah, maybe, but I've never minded that because w once you've written it and published it, then it's kind of not yours anyway. It's you know the reader can misinterpret it yeah. and then it's partly your fault if they have because it's <laughs> ambiguous and they, or they can mistake your motives they can assume things like we said earlier on that they're autobiographical which they aren't and so in some ways it's no different to that this process of collaboration yeah. and it must be just as bad for the artist because surely they don't know how you're going to respond to their work and you might imply things about <laughs> yeah. them and it's, it's terrifying yeah. I think it comes back to that point where maybe within the fine arts it's just a bit more expected, uh, accepted. Sorry, that yeah. um, people will do that to your work, you know, Definitely. because you're you're putting it in galleries. It's actually one reason that I moved away from fine art and went more into writing because it's a bit more immediate, especially when you're reading live. Yeah, putting stuff in galleries is quite. Um, you have this disconnect with your audience because you put it up, you have an opening evening, you meet people then but then you walk away and it's there for two months and you never hear again, unless there's a review, you never hear what people think. Whereas with live poetry, this is not, not, I'm not talking about publishing books, but live poetry, you do get immediate feedback. Yeah. Um, I, I find it strange as well, as a visual artist, you could effectively lose bits of your work forever. If you sell a painting to somebody, it is then their painting, yes, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. not you haven't actually got it anymore. And that I would think be it, really weird. It's actually what I like about my writing now. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter what, anybody thinks is always mine yeah you know, and you do have you really have the ability to to do it which is may, maybe why you're able to remain guarded as a poet because it's always your child or yeah you know, it's always your creation yeah. and it's always personal it doesn't matter how many books you sell it's the, the it's poem still so exists in your head you know right. this is a poem called other people's dreams the lives you have in other people's dreams are lives no less tonight for instance you are kissing the proprietor of spa in a storeroom full of oranges. A school friend has you kneeling in a lay-by of a mountain pass, grappling with the front tyre of a truck. And though your hair is jet black for disguise, you are the photographer in your mother's nightmare, angling the camera at her door. Each morning, you must gather up these lives and hold them tight, walk carefully downstairs, Slow as the girl in your own brief dream, who clutched a dozen long-stemmed roses to her dress until they merged into a bloodstain on her ruined breast. Uh, you spoke in an interview with Granta back in 2013 about the idea of poetry haunting you, mm -hmm. and that you were about being visited by the idea for a poem that won't leave you. Yeah. Um, can you try and give our listeners an insight into the creative poetry? I'm not asking you to tell people how to write poetry. <laughs> <laughs> Just a brief description of the de development of an idea into, into yeah. poem. Um, it's a good job you're not asking me to tell them how to write poetry because <laughs> I don't know. If I did know, then I'd just write, I'd try and write brilliant poems all the time. Um, for me, a lot of my beginnings of poems do come from sound, from okay. almost like an earworm or something, something that won't go away. So... It does sound like a cliche, but quite often I'll be doing something else. I'll either be walking or maybe running or out somewhere. Mm. Or sometimes it happens, which is a bit 
embarrassing when I'm listening to somebody else read another writer or somebody yeah. talk I'll get this thing in my head and I have to sort of run the lines over and over in my head until they settle into a pattern and it's almost as if I can sort of see them in my mind's eye kind of slotting into place a bit like um, some kind of Tetris type thing yeah. and um, I'll, I'll often not write it down for a long time I kind of repeat the lines over and over in the hope that when I do finally come to write it down, um, I'll have forgotten the weaker stuff and I'll, the stuff that's stuck will be the the good stuff or the better stuff anyway. But sometimes you do just have to try and write it down as soon as possible. And it's terrible when you're at an event and there's lots of people around and you're like, I just need to write this, this, this line, I, I'm going to forget it. So often it's quite a stressful process. I was, was going to say, actually, um, it, I didn't know whether it was just a way was put up on the Grand Theatre website mm -hmm. or whether I got the impression that inspiration wasn't necessarily a very pleasant thing all the time. No. <laughs> you know, cause you, you know. yeah. I think it's tied up with, I don't know if you find this as well, but it's also sometimes it's tied up with a bit of anxiety about, I always think that um, poems are better before you've written them. That when the poem <laughs> just exists in your head as this idea of the poem you're going to write, you think, wow, yeah, I'll yeah. say all this in it. And obviously the real thing's always going to be a bit of a disappointment. You don't quite express yourself properly. You don't feel like you've done it justice. There's there's this horrible gap, isn't there, between what you understand and what you see and what you're able to express to other people. Yeah. It's just a continual source of And I suppose once you stress. get into writing regularly as well, having an initial idea will just bring back that memory of knowing that you're not going to be able to do a very good job of it. You yeah. know, that it brings that, that, so that anxiety is coming up immediately whether you've tried to realise it or not. You, know, yeah. you, you still get that pang of... <laughs> and, and, and yet, depressingly, I think if, you, if you're somebody that loves to write, um, the reason that you're doing it as well is because you still feel that that's your best way of getting close to saying yes. what yeah, you yeah. mean. Because you feel like you're really bad in conversation, you're really bad at talking to people and, and saying what you mm. mean verbally perhaps yeah. so it's your kind of your one chance to get it right so yeah. if you screw that up then that's quite, it. quite often I'll, people will say to me oh what have you been doing today and I say, oh, I've been writing and they, oh that's nice and you go, no you don't understand yeah it's not nice <laughs> <laughs> it's really nice. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, actually, so yeah, talking about thought, thought processes and stuff. You, on your blog, Poetry on the Brain, mm -hmm. you, and obviously with your um, background with studying psychology, you talk a lot about uh, neuroscience mm -hmm. and the study of writers' brains a lot. Um, I'm, I'm not going to pretend that I've read too much about that, but if you, have you got anything you'd like to say about that? How much does that influence your does it influence your writing at all or is it just a side interest? Yeah, it is a side interest really. I got a bit worried when I started studying, when I say studying neuroscience, this makes it sound like I've been in the lab <laughs> cutting up brains, but definitely not. Mm. It's purely from, from a theoretical perspective, sure. so I've just been reading other people's papers mm. and other people's work. And I find it really interesting, um, the, the attempts that are being made to understand things about what happens in our brains when we write I think that's great yeah. I think we but I think we should never forget that correlation doesn't always mean causation just yes. because yeah. two things are going on doesn't mean one's making the other happen and otherwise you could be very reductive about writing processes which is still really mysterious mm. and I did get worried at first that if I read about these things I might become too self-conscious myself when I'm thinking or when I'm writing but that doesn't seem to have happened really yeah. I, I still forget it all when I'm in the process of writing a poem maybe because as you, as you you sort of implied to talk about your own writing it's really all consuming when you're trying to write something you don't have room for these no, side no, no. thoughts and so I just find it fascinating it's, it's as much of a mystery to me as what happens when a poem's being written yeah. literature and neuroscience are both really mysterious things mm -hmm. and the more you read just the more questions you get about it really. but, I mean the reason I brought it up was one to mention the blog because mm -hmm. I think a lot of people will be really interested in it and two to highlight this idea that there's a quote I can't remember who the quotes by but this idea that Stephen Hawking said the, the um, a brief history of time, which is most probably one of the most complicated books you could ever try and read. It was yeah. a, a huge bestseller. People are not scared of big ideas. They're not yeah. scared, scared of complicated ideas. Yet they're scared of poetry. Yeah. Right? And all it is is that we haven't. It, and the argument is in this quote that um, artists, if we take all artists, haven't thought about what they do enough in order to explain it to the general public. Because I 
I've got this is just a, a personal feeling I've got and I've got no evidence I would say that people most people would be happier trying to understand your blog poetry on the brain than read your poetry My poetry yeah definitely. you know and it, and the neuroscience is probably far com more complicated but for some reason people are less scared about these and it might just be because we have some sort of basis of knowledge regarding our science education at school yeah and biology we sort of know what the brain looks like and the sort of electricity running through it even if we don't understand how that works but yeah. there's a basis there and it links back to what you mentioned earlier on I think about terms of engagement with poetry mm. and education and things like that and hearing I was saying about hearing people read their poems it is very often you do just need to <coughs> give people a bit of a hand a yeah. way into stuff um, I remember working with a book group in Chesterfield not that long ago and they, none of them had ever read poetry before and they were really worried about discussing it and <laughs> trying to and it, at the end of it I just went in and talked about where a few of my poems had come from a bit of context and and why I'd wanted to write about those things and I think for some of them it suddenly made a bit more sure. sense and I'm sure that all poets could come and do do things like that and it's, it's you're completely right it's just about finding the right way in yes uh, final questions mm -hmm. uh, who or what has been the biggest influence on your writing and um, who would you recommend to our listeners to check out and it could be any uh, up and we're not talking about writers here it could be um, any art artists that's such a difficult question mm. because there's probably so many and um, really strangely I think one of the people who's had the biggest influence on my writing is not a poet at all it's probably the folk musician Richard Thompson okay. whose music I really love and I just love the way he puts difficult things and also stories into a form um, musical form in his case rather than a, a sort of just a although his lyrics are brilliant and really yeah. really good as well and I guess I've always grown up with that because my dad loves his music he was always playing folk music when I was a kid and it filters into your head and then as I've got older I've found his music a, just a real source of reinvigoration and, and inspiration when at those times when you're not really sure what you're doing and what you're about and what you want to say I, I often end up going back to him as a kind of yeah. touchstone in some ways so yeah maybe I'll, I'll say it's him mm. um, and in terms of people that I'd recommend to listeners to check out wow there's so many um, <laughs> well if they're interested um, they may have been listening to this podcast because they're interested in things to do with the miners strike um, if so I really recommend a pamphlet by uh, someone called Paul Bentley called yeah. Largo which is about his experiences of the strike but okay. he intersperses it with um, things about music that was out at the time so that's really really interesting um, if they're interested in the brain and the mind <laughs> um, but it's relevance to culture and art then I'd recommend a book by Ian McGilchrist called The Master and His Emissary which I write about a heck of a lot on my blog yeah, probably yeah. too much which is a really interesting theory of um, society as much as, as, as the brain um, and other things that I've been reading recently um, I do tend to read more non-fiction and fiction than I do poetry but the last couple of collections I read was um, Kate Tempest's Hold Your Own okay. I really enjoyed yeah. that um, and thought the poems left me quite enthusiastic about what you can do with mm. poetry um, so I got very absorbed in that and also a collection by an American poet called Joshua Mehigan um, who I think is just brilliant and he, he does amazing things with form and with, with language and he's, he's just clever without showing off about it <laughs> which is the, I always think it's the best yeah, yeah. thing for a poet to be. So they're my current, that's my current reading list and a, a couple of older things oh, I guess. I think that's, that's quite interesting. Oh. Um, that's it. I've just left uh, well thank you again Helen no, Moore thank you Charlie the Whippet is really well behaved he's just he's asleep on quiet. the sofa he did have a little um, a little big. scratch around at one point which you might have heard uh, I suppose yeah just a few plugs you can check out it's helenmoore.com isn't it that's the right. website and then poetry on the brain is the blog and like I mentioned at the beginning you can get uh, uh, Helen's book Division Street um, through Chateau and Windows so 
on sale in a lot of bookshops and through evil Amazon. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this has been Poetry Luna, Poetry Podcast.